Um, this is Jen the Liberty Lion, and I, in my research came across this pretty interesting little paper here that I wanted to read to you guys, and um, I'm going to read it because it's something that, that it's a letter to Congress. I just want to point out a couple of things here. So your remonstrance, the remonstrance are the people who are writing this paper, and they're writing it to the honorable, honorable. Senate and House of Representatives of the United States. Now I say of the United States because if you've been following me and watching my videos, you know that the United States in Congress assembled is the Constitution, the authorities in the Constitution. Those authorities are for the people on the federal lands for the most part. They're not um, laws for people off federal lands. So a lot of people say, oh, the taxes are in. Okay, the taxes were for the federal government to be able to tax the people on those public federal lands, like such, such as the officers when they are um, using the public lands for private gain. And this is all talked about in other videos. I've showed proof of it to you. I've showed you the officer's manuals, so on and so forth. The United States of America in Congress assembled is under the... Um, Articles of Confederation, and the Articles of Confederation are for the free, sovereign, and independent states. And uh, I've showed much proof of that to you. People say, well, the Articles of Confederation were repealed or replaced. They were not, and I've showed you proof of that. Um, Judge Andrew Napolitano has talked about that. The Constitution has been vastly exaggerated, not only in scope, but in the land of which it um, is is over, called Lex uh, Citus, the uh, law of the land is not the entire country, when you're talking about the stuff in the Constitution. Okay, so that's just a brief reca recap of some of the stuff I've gone over and why this letter says to the Honorable, the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States and not of the United States of America. Okay, so um, free, sovereign, and independent states are in Article Two of the con of the um, Articles of Confederation, and what this is is a letter to the United States um, on behalf of Colonel Butler, who was charged with a crime for not cutting his hair. Okay, so they're calling it disobedience of orders justified on the ground of illegality. So what they're saying is that this guy showed up, he didn't have his hair cut, he couldn't cut his hair, wouldn't cut his hair, what have you, and so they charged him with a crime, and the crime at the time was illegal. Now, there are many things that the government and non-government instrumentalities tell us are laws, federal laws, and that we must follow them when in fact they are not federal laws and we do not have to follow them. And even if they were passed into law, they, um, they can't go against reason, common sense, the laws of nature, so on and so forth, and so they would be illegal. Okay, so I'm just going to read this to you. So this is a good time for you to just listen while you are working or driving or cleaning house or um, whatever it is that you do when you aren't staring at your phone. This is from um, the Library of Congress. It's memory website and uh, hopefully by now if you've been following you know what that website is. This is from 1805. The heading on this paper is called Disobedience of Orders Justified on the Grounds of Illegality. Page 173. And I'm talking about here number 54. This is the 8th Congress, second session, disobedience of orders justified on the ground of illegality, communicated to the Senate January 30th, 1805, to the Honorable, the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States, the remonstrance and petition of sundry citizens and officers of the militia in the state of Tennessee. Okay, so I'm just going to read it to you. Your remonstrance, having those respectful feelings for your honorable body, which citizens ought to possess, and which those bearing commissions in the militia ought ever to cherish, 
beg leave to represent. That they have, with much concern, seen a veteran and meritorious officer in the Army of the United States arrested for imaginary crimes, compelled to travel a distance of 1,500 miles to stand his trial, and that trial then postponed for several months, contrary not only to the rules and articles of war, but also to those natural rules of justice, to the benefit of which every member of society is entitled. That the only crime of which he was found guilty and the only one perhaps of which any serious expectation of convicting him was ever entertained, was a refusal to crop his hair in conformity to an order which he conceived to be illegal and which your remonstrance conceive to have been an arbitrary and useless exertion of authority that in the execution of the sentence of the court-martial which subjected him to a reprimand from the commanding general your remonstrance have been able to discover not only or not the calmness and dignity to be expected from a person invested with so high an office but a disposition to passion and invective, well calculated to make impressions unfavorable to the military character of the accused and foreboding a renewal of persecution. Your remonstrance have been prompted to an expression of these feelings, not only from a disposition to resist oppression from whatever quarter it may come, even if directed against the most humble and obscure member of the community, but also from a long acquaintance with the person injured in this instance, a knowledge of his virtue and integrity as a man and his bravery and fidelity as a soldier. During a command of several years at a post where not only the greatest firmness and the strictest attention to discipline were necessary, but also the discharge of his duty in enforcing obedience to the laws had an almost unavoidable tendency to create numerous implicable enemies. In this situation, the true state of which was but little known beyond the bounds of this state, we have seen him not only cause the laws to be respected and obeyed, but also by the humanity and decency of his conduct, conciliate the esteem of the offenders and cause those to refrain through affection from fear whom fear alone had been found insufficient to restrain. In other situations also, in all of which no glory or reputation in the view of the world could be acquired and where no reward awaited him beyond the approbation of his own conscience, we have ever seen him patient, persevering, industrious, and obedient to all orders which were in any way directed to the promotion of the public good in fine, we declare that in the whole of his official conduct, which has fallen under our inspection, we have seen much commanding our approbation and deserving our imitation, but nothing which, in our opinion, even malice itself could censure. Your remonstrance further beg leave to call to the recollection of your honorable body that the accused, Colonel Butler, entered into the service of his country early in the Revolutionary War, during the whole of which depressing and perilous period he stood firm and active as an officer, 
after its close, his desire to serve his country continued. The defeat at the site of Fort Recovery, which witnessed the death of General Butler, left his brother among the wounded. Search the history of the American army and you will often find the name of Butler. But where was it marked with disgrace? Was he ever accused of disobedience? Never, until the case occurred to which we now call your attention. When roused by the signal of danger, he was first at his post and the first to refuse submission to indignity. The pride of a veteran of 26 years service was roused by the order for cropping his venerable gray hairs, an order unsanctioned either by law, reason, or the usages of the army. Your remonstrance further represent that possessing the principles of freemen, they shudder at the idea of being compelled to obey an illegal and arbitrary mandate, that possessing the feelings of men, they can never passively stoop to such degradation. While the delegated powers of the Union are generally circumscribed by barriers which they must not overlap, how long must it be regretted that our fellow citizens of the Army are subject to an authority absolute and arbitrary? How much is it to be feared that the uncontrolled power of a commander of your army shall, by the force of a general order, drive from your service the most experienced and most useful officers, oppress the bravest and most virtuous men, pursue with unrelenting persecution, under pretext the most frivolous, those who have fought your battles and spilled their blood in your defense, and finally degrade the military character of your army by illegal and unnecessary orders, unmerited censures, malicious arrests, and reprimands, cruel if not ridiculous. Your remonstrants are well aware of the necessity of discipline and subordination in an army, but they cannot conceive it the duty of a freeman to obey an order unsanctioned by law, without meaning, without utility, capricious and absurd, irrelative to the duties of a soldier, degrading to a man, and destructive to that pride which constitutes the soul of an army. If this despotic abuse of power is tolerated, when shall it cease? Shall your militia, when called out in defense of their country, partake of the humiliation? Shall they be compelled to sustain a mutilation of honor the caprice of an individual? Must they submit to a mark to render them unlike their fellow citizens? They hope not. And that whether their country requires the calling out of a military force from the body of its citizens, it will not be shackled with such humiliating conditions as to render it ineffectual. Under the impressions excited by the transaction, which has called forth an expression of these sentiments, your petitioners hope, with due submission and respect, that your honorable body will ordain and establish such articles and rules for the future regulation of the army as will prevent abuses of power and preserve from indignity and insult those who devote their lives to the service of their country. 
your remonstrance beg leave further to represent that Colonel Thomas Butler of the United States Army is the character that has been thus illegally and improperly dealt with, and in consequence thereof, the feelings of your remonstrance have been raised to make that representation of facts which they have now done, and they also beg leave to represent that the order alluded to in this remonstrance is radically illegal and despotic, that the cause which gave it to it birth is trifling and unworthy of the attention of a great general belonging to the United States Army, and therefore, as Republicans, we feel ourselves justified and emboldened in bringing to the view of your honorable body this particular situation. We, your remonstrance, further and lastly beg leave to make known to your honorable body the second arrest of Colonel Thomas Butler of the United States Army for the simple crime of not cropping his hair during his late command at New Orleans and hope your honorable body will not only render such general relief as the nature of our government requires in its present peculiar state of good order and tranquility, but that you will specifically relieve this worthy, aged, and respectable officer, Colonel Butler, from persecution. Andrew Jackson, Major General. Shadrach Nye, Adjunct. Charles Donoho, James Wilson, W.J. Anderson, aide-de-camp to Major General, Daniel Smith, J. Whiteside, Attorney General, Henry Bradford, Major, William Trigg, Jr., G. O. Blackmore, Brigade Major, James Cryer, Justice of the Peace. Hinchy Pedwat, Pedway, Merchant. Thomas Mitchell. James Deshaw, Merchant. Robert B. Mitchell. B. Sewell, Attorney at Law and Colonel. Nathaniel W. Williams, Attorney at Law. Robert White. Attorney at Law. John Bowen, Attorney at Law. J. Horton, Attorney at Law. J. Hutchings, Merchant. H. G. Burton, Attorney at Law. Josephus H. Kuhn, Merchant. Thomas Master, Major. James Minnell, Senator Griswold Latimer, Captain Demi Moore, Major William Gwynn, Captain Joseph T. Williams, Major Isaac Lang, Captain Archibald Marlin, Magistrate J.C. Hamilton, Attorney at Law David Shelby, Clerk, S.C. Thomas Stewart, Attorney for West Tennessee District. William W. Ruse, Colonel. Isham T. Davis, Captain. William Montgomery, Justice of the Peace. J. Winchester, Brigadier General, 4th Brigade. Edward Douglas, Lieutenant Colonel, Sumner County. William Hall. Stockley Donaldson, Colonel. Thomas Harney. Robert Hayes, Colonel. Robert Purdy, late Captain, United States Army. J. 
Jonathan Dickinson, attorney at law. Jonathan Anderson, merchant. Samuel Finney. John Gordon, captain. Joseph Hayes, doctor. Thomas A. Claiborne, formerly of the Army of the United States. A. Foster, merchant. John McNary, judge, etc. William Tate, merchant. Diedrich and Tatum, merchants, Nashville. Stephen Contrell. James Tatum, Lieutenant, 3rd, NCR, late Revolutionary Army. J. Childress, Junior Marshal. King, Carson, and King, Merchants, Nashville. Thomas Dillahunty, Justice of the Peace. Moses Fisk. Roger B. Sappington, Physician of Nashville. Bill Bosley. William Little. John Childress. William Black. Joseph Irwin. Thomas Thompson. William Russell. R.C. Foster, member of the legislature. Robert and William Searcy, merchants. Thomas Kruchner, treasurer. Marrow District. Chom Tom James Hennen, M.D. J. H. Parker. Joseph Coleman. Honorable Tadier, late captain of the Revolutionary Army of the United States. Please consider liking, sharing, subscribing, leaving a comment, and pressing that little notification button so that you can see the next time I post a video. Again, this is from the website memory.loc.gov. This is under the heading of Disobedience of Orders Justified on the Ground of Illegality, document number 54, 8th Congress, 2nd Session.